Hey everyone, how you doing? Um, it is 5.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, October the 2nd, 2021 years from something. This should be part 10. <laughs> I always forget what part it is. Should be part 10 for sure, for sure, of Let's Consider Luke. <clears throat> I'm starting a little late in the day because, well, I have bigger fish to fry. Now, not saying this isn't important because it is that all of this is is very important it's just i can't put the same kind of time into this that is demanded in other things mostly the study of language and whatnot so this one's going to be interesting because I'm, I'm probably not going to even go past chapter 16 on this i know that on the last one i spent the entire time mostly expounding on one particular verse and what the problem was with stating the verse in the way it was because it wasn't stating that facet of law which is repeated over and over again in the law and the prophets it wasn't stating it correctly so uh, a lot of time had to be spent on that of course this one it's going to be a little bit different because uh, not only are we examining the things that are different very 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 different about Luke and particular to this account we're gonna look at some other things too but we're pretty much gonna stay in Luke 16 the only thing that's really left to cover of course is the apparent parable of Lazarus and the rich man and I I didn't realize that I, I hadn't properly addressed the comments actually made between the apparent parable of the unrighteous steward and the singular verse on divorce and remarriage. Luke 16 is just a, a gemstone of strangeness. Because, first off, the... <laughs> The subjects of, for like, the apparent parables, they don't quite seem to follow. We want to look for, for one thing, we do want to look for a coherency in the flow of information. You know, um, the Son of God, he's going to have a, he's going to have a co coherency to what he's saying and the way that the information that he's being given there it's going to have a logical flow of thought and delivery and we would look for that we would look for that in an account that we wanted to see as as good and authentic and trustworthy for sure we don't see that in Luke 16 not with the subject matter going from this unrighteous steward and then there's a little bit of um, narrative in Luke 16 14 and 15 and then we go right back into the red letters and everyone knows the red letters are Jesus speaking I think one thing that's important just to remember when considering because sometimes you know we get if we're reading an account, let's just say we're reading the Gospel of Luke, and there are chapters worth of monologue, or chapters worth of dialogue, we do sometimes, I do sometimes have the tendency to forget the setting, the context. And we always have to remember the context. Because whatever is being said, whether it's monologue or dialogue, it should be in proper relation to the context. But the only context we really have to go on is a couple of chapters earlier. We see basically just Jesus going from one place to another and people following him. And then it says that, and, and he said this to the crowds of people and then the last descriptive passage of context we have is saying that he had gone to someone's house to eat 
And then there was criticism, of course, from, you know, scribes and Pharisees. And then all of everything we see as far as monologue and dialogue from that point in time are just basically supposed to be in the context of him, him being criticized for keeping the company that he was keeping. That's, that's the narrative. So when I look at um, the subject matter going from this parable of the unrighteous steward to, well, this little passage that I'm, I, I'm just going to point out just a couple of things, okay? From Luke 16, 14 through 17, and then that little insert on divorce and remarriage, and then to Lazarus and the rich man. The content doesn't really appear to follow. Now, somebody could say, well, it does follow, because he's what he's doing with these parables, and they're not all parables, he's also making statements. We can see that from verse 14 through 18. They're not parables, those are statements. Somebody could say, well, he's, uh, of course, he's, you know, pointing this, uh, th these are being <clears throat> spoken directly to the Pharisees. Um, all right. If that's the case, then it, I don't know if it's fair to even call them parables, because he does explain in Matthew why he spoke oftentimes in parables. Uh, he explained it to his disciples. We know that part of uh, the account, the story of the unrighteous steward, was directed towards his disciples also, you know. So it would be hard to say that those are parables. And then in, in other Gospels, we do have him really clarifying a lot of his parables to his disciples, remember? Just, it's really strange. It, it doesn't it doesn't have this a good coherent flow that we would really hope to find. Now, I'm not saying, when I say this good co coherent flow, I'm not saying that we should absolutely be able to understand everything right off the bat. Of course, he, he said a lot of things, and we can find a, a, a lot of material in the Bible that's mysterious, that's difficult to understand. Even if, even if we had all of it in good translations and there weren't a number of words and terms that have been altered by, by Masoretes and, and um, sectarian scholars and such, there would still be a lot of passages that would be difficult and we'd have to work out what's being said. And that's, you know, that's Yahweh's prerogative. He can do that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying, well, it's, it's a bit difficult. It's difficult, so I don't like it. I'm the last person that's going to say something like that. But if it's so cryptic in the sense of, like, for instance, the account of the unrighteous steward, he's either saying, either the point of what he was saying was literally, to laud the actions of this shyster, this unrighteous steward, or, or tell his disciples that they should align themselves with the, the factions, the mindset, and the people of this world, which are against God, remember? Because you can't serve both God and mammon, right? If he's not saying that, then we don't have a clue. What a... You know, what, 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 what is he saying here? I wrote a, 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 an entire blog entry, not, not, and I don't have it published for good reason, because it just, it was so difficult. And when I finally got to the end of it, and I wrote one, not only on the, the parable or the story, the account of the unrighteous steward, but also Lazarus and the rich man. Because both of them are so bizarre, and they have to be dealt with because they're so weird, and because it's there's so much conjecture out there, and they're they're used by so many different people to to try to make so many various points that are really disagreeable. 
And even that right there, maybe, should be at least some kind of sign to us. Um, so the first thing that I didn't address in the last one or two was just these few verses from Luke 14 through 17. Because they're kind of interesting. They're, they're kind of interesting and they actually highlight a couple of things that I think all of us should keep in mind. You don't have to know uh, Koine Greek so-called to keep these things in mind. Anybody who uses decent software knows how to just uh, check certain words by Strong's in the software and stuff. There's a You can get pretty far doing that. And you know, anyone who is committed to actually just knowing what English versions we have to the best of their ability can be a very effective, correct preacher. I, I've never told anyone that we couldn't be effective by simply knowing these things in our native tongue. But there's so much that we need to understand because not everything is correct in the Bible according to the translations in our native tongue. Not everything is correct according to the translations that have been produced and handed down to us from the Masoretes, and that's why you can't trust Strong's, and you know, anything that's based on Jacinius. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm afraid not. The reason we can trust a lot of the, a lot of the language that we find in the Bible is it has a lot to do essentially with laws of language. Language is really great in the sense that language is quite basic. Uh, most languages, if, if not all languages, maybe I should just say all languages, they are all a, a, a tool or a type of currency that are all trying to achieve similar goals. Now, that doesn't mean that language can't be distorted very badly so that the people who change it can actually achieve their goals and fool others. That can happen. That's called English. But the thing about language is when you just sit about you sit and think, what is language trying to accomplish? The philosophy of language. What are, at the end of the day, what's what is language doing? It's communicating. It's communicating ideas. It's communicating uh, thoughts. Same thing. Um, it is communicating things that have happened. It is communicating things that will happen. It communicates desires, which that, that just goes back to thoughts. And I don't want to complicate this. And, and it does it by using a, a rather small but extraordinarily effective set of tools. Y your basics are things actions, and words that properly connect things and actions. Because if you successfully combine the things and actions together with those, you know, connector words like prepositions and conjunctions and things like that, you can successfully convey thoughts. You can successfully convey desires and emotions you can successfully convey things that actually happen and you can describe them and in detail if you just properly put these things together but language is basic the problem with sophistry and people who tweak language and change it is they have to they oftentimes have to complicate language in order to achieve this. And English is quite complicated in a number of ways. They have taken a root language that was simpler and have further complicated it. That, that's one of the things that I will celebrate. Out of very few things I would celebrate about the Dialave book, The Hebraic Tongue Restored, which is just a chore sometimes to read even a page of that. 
is that he does illustrate the way that in general not just one language but language in general has been complicated over the years it has in fact it's been very complicated and that's one of the things we should tend to look for if we're concerned a language has been compromised however even in so doing there are only certain aspects there are only certain words that can be changed the whole point would be to to look you take a work okay say they're they're taking what was available to us at the time when what we'll, we'll say the Masoretes, you know started applying this masora to the the old testament text and we're going to leave the koine greek out of this for now but it does apply the same principles do apply what they're going to tend to do is not say okay well we need to completely change all of this because there's no way they would never have a hope or prayer of being able to do that because they still had the text that had to stay intact they did change the look of the character but the text stayed intact the reason that I would say they changed the look of the character is because the Western European tribes, the Germanics um, and kindreds, they, they had the same alphabet in a similar language that looked exactly like it. So they changed the look of it from being what I call Obery, which you can see the older text looks like the Germanic in English and so on. So they changed the look of it. That's one thing. I think they changed the orientation. That's another thing. But they can't just go in there and start saying, well, we're going to change all of these words. We're going to change this preposition to that preposition. We're going to change on to in. And we, they couldn't do it. They could not do that. Because when you start applying these uh, these roots and and uh, a number of words that you're going to see over and over again hundreds and hundreds of times throughout all of those books you know that we would consider the Old Testament 39 books so if you want to accept all of them including Esther that's fine but let's just say out of all of those we're gonna have all we're gonna have some of these things occurring hundreds of times some phenomenon thousands of times you see when you see the uh, the glyph u, u, u at the at the beginning of um, a, a phrase or a word, it's a it's it acts conjunctively. There, there's no way they could change that. Now they tweak it sometimes from and to but, maybe or, but they can't just completely change it. They had to look at the whole and they had to decide these. These things, these ideas that it's conveying in certain areas is harmful to us if there is general knowledge of it. We need to change these certain things and we need to figure out how we can best do that. That, would, that is the most logical way they went about doing this. And it's, it's also the most successful way. Because like I said, they can't completely change the whole thing around. It would be nonsense talk because... All languages are all basically the same in the sense that they're conveying certain things. It is a certain currency that always is just like if you go from one cult culture or country to another. And the currency looks a little bit different. It may act a little bit different, but it's all achieving the same goals. That's why you, you can trust a certain amount of the structure and body. But what you have to do, you have to look for those little things. It's like it's like looking for a counterfeit. You have to look for those little things that are out of place. There's something wrong. You you would have to look for things that could kind of easily be swapped and 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 changed and fooled with. You just have to keep a spotlight on those things. File those things, even if you don't understand. Um, like. In uh, the Obery Hours, I show you in, in depth and detail how things are changed, how they can successfully do these things, and how they have to stick to a system to do that. I show you the ways that it doesn't work by illustrating how these Strong's entries, they're, they're not consistent. They have so many different uh, forms, you know, of these entries and such. I show you those things. Um, 
but that's kind of the way that these things have to happen. So if you understand that, the first thing you can you can know is okay. Well, there still is you know somebody can have a still a good amount of success because the overall ideas that you're going to get in many ways are going to be good and consistent. Okay. So the word is still preserved in a lot of those ways. And there's no, no need to panic. There's no need for anybody to say, you know, see, it's, it's all bunk, because it's not. But we have to get to a point of, of being um, knowledgeable and understanding enough to know that, yeah, a lot of changes actually can be made, but at the same time, the, uh, the heart of it and certain absolute truths of it can still be extracted just knowing English and, and being diligent, you know, using what tools we have. I, I do explain that a lot because I know that some people who maybe don't understand a lot about the, the, the languages that we currently have, you know, the old manuscripts in, they may have a tendency to think certain things about changes to the text that maybe aren't quite true. You need to understand that there are ways that things can be changed. There are ways that ideas and concepts can be changed without changing other things like the overall. These things can be done. And we need to know how they can be done and their mechanisms. Because for one thing, as I said, we need to keep our eye on certain terminology. And that's one of the things I do when I test words in Obery in the Old Testament. I test them in a number of ways so that I can see if they have been misappropriated or misapplied in certain... Can I see them in the same context over and over again? And if I do, are they translated quite differently from one to the other? And if they are, what was it that those who changed it into something so radically different were trying to hide? That's the point. So what's interesting in Luke is um, it says from Luke 16, 14 through 17, I'll read the, uh, the KJV translation of it. This is directly after the, uh, the story, whether it was a parable or not, I, I don't know, of the unrighteous steward. Right after that, it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things and derided him. So he wasn't speaking directly to them, apparently. You see, and it did say that he was speaking to his disciples at a certain point in that. So that's weird because he's bouncing back and forth when we go back to considering the context of what he's saying and if there is a logical flow to this, right? Okay. So they're, they're saying he, they overheard him. He was speaking to somebody else. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Now, were is gray italics. Okay, so they had to insert that. The law and the prophets until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So here's the weird things I'm going to point out to you. Not just the fact that that quote in Luke 7, uh, 16, 17, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than one. Okay. Um, that's, of course, out of chronological place. What else is new with Matthew? What else is new? It's other interesting things that I haven't really brought up much. Because besides this series, I mean, I don't spend a ton of time, you know, talking about New Testament, because there's, there's a lot of issues in the New Testament. There's a lot of issues. Um, 
which I won't go into now because then it'll, that'll take up a lot of the time that I, I don't want to make this too long. So one thing I haven't talked a lot about, but I've looked into a lot is this group. This group that, you know, we, we see Jesus at odds with a lot. Now, not necessarily more than other groups, but a lot. And, and it was probably because of the, the certain prominence that they had, which brought them to loggerheads, you know. What they're called the Pharisees. They're called the Pharisees. It's, it's transliterated. Okay, P-H-A-R-I-S-E-E-S, -E -E Pharisees. Now, when you see that E, uh, uh, a plural with an E at the end, Pharisees and Sadducees, you know that that's actually more than likely it was derived from an obery term because the obery plural is stated in one of two different ways, either with a YM ending or just a Y ending. So it could be im or e, depending on the context. Okay. Now in the Koine, they use a, um, a phi and not a pi. That's probably why it was transliterated PH Pharisee. It's a uh, phi alpha rho iota sigma. Um, alpha, iota, omicron, sigma, okay, and it's uh, it's pronounced pharaseos, or just pharase, which that a a i at the end, it's e. Here's why that's really interesting, very interesting. One reason is because. When words from Obery are transliterated into this Koine Greek weirdness of language, they're not consistently transliterated. We know this because you'll, you will even see words that fall into, let's say, the same Strong's entry. And sometimes they'll have, for instance, uh, an, an Omicron uh, accent to them. At the end, sometimes they'll have an uh, omega accent to them. So we know that we're looking at empty, meaningless letters and not meaningful glyphs. And you can do a lot when you can start playing with empty, meaningless language and letters as opposed to being locked into glyphs that build simple biglyph roots that all have meanings because those those simple roots that you're building, those uh, glyphs interact with one another in a meaningful way. And as you continue to build that word, those glyphs are interacting with one another in a meaningful way. And once you have that word built and you put it in context with other words that have been built in meaningful ways, those combinations of words have very specific, meaningful things. You see, y you could say, well, Obri is it's just so base and simple in a sense, though it's not. But the thing is, even with a, a glyphic language, let's say that, that everything was based on very concrete uh, ideas, you still, once you start building words, and the more glyphs you add on to a word, the more expressive it can become and then you put those word combinations together and things become even more and more and more expressive you can do so much with language that's why you don't need a language like hieroglyphics that has these gosh is it hundreds of um, either pictures or letters that seem to be combined into this insane you know language I don't know how they can say they've actually figured it out but you know, in Obri, you've got 22 glyphs, and they're plenty enough to express any possible concept that needs expressing to us. Koine, like English, is a series of letters. 
They have no meaning. And that's demonstrated in the fact that when they transliterate a number of, let's say, just proper names, or even concepts that um, they don't have an acceptable translation to in, in the Koine Greek, we can see this in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is this great, deep repository of how transliteration and, and fooling around what, what sort of fooling around you can do when you transliterate from one language that's made up of, of very solid, meaningful glyphs that have roots that repeat themselves in concepts over and over again. It's a good demonstration of what you can do when you don't have to stay to glyphs that have to follow, you know, logical cognates and roots and things like that. So, what happens is you get proper names that um, sometimes a, a a Greek letter will be used that has a a k sound, and sometimes some with a ch sound because you know Greek. There's a few different Greek letters that are repetitive phonetics. Okay, so you will find. Um, see, Obri only has P. Obri does not have any F sound at all. There's no F. -th. Okay, there's no V, V, V sound in Obri. There's no F, F, F sound in Obri. There is P. There is the sound of P, P, and B, B. So if we see this word, Pharisee, in English, it's coming from this Phariseos in Koine Greek, which means it could come from one of a few possibilities in Obri. And it, it, no matter which one, it's going to have to start with a P. You don't have a lot of possibilities. The same thing with the Rho. That's going to have to come from the R or R in Obri. The only thing left is whether that Sigma comes from the sh, or the s, or ts, or z. That's the tricky thing about the Koine Greek Sigma, is because they use it over a number of letters, um, glyphs, obriglyphs, like four, potentially four. So we can cross-reference, we can look for words in obri that would have any one of those four, the combination would have to be P, R, then one of those four. And if we look at the P, R with a Sh, eh, we find a couple of entries, but it really doesn't follow why they would be named this, this Parash, okay? If we looked at it with Sa, it would have to be, they would have to be named for um, somebody Basically, a thing that was broken or shattered, Peretz. All right. And then if it was Z, Peraz, they could possibly be from that too. And we would have to reference who they were and, you know, why they would be from, from that. We can, we can look at certain different possibilities. So I'll just give you examples of what it could be, depending on if we insert one of these, you know, four different glyphs that we could. If it was Peraz with a Z that it was being transliterated from, the, the greatest uh, amount of relatively trustworthy translations of Peraz is like village dwellers. Okay? Um, doesn't sound likely with these Pharisees that we're talking about village dwellers, not based on the influence they had and everything we can find out about them in the New Testament. <clears throat> it's just not very likely. A lot of these are also, there are people that are, are named these things too, because names typically came from a more concrete concept. Could they have all been of a family or tribe of that name? Probably not as likely, but okay. I'm just giving you what the possibilities are. So I'm not holding anything back. All right, so the next letter, we're, we're going to just glyph 
um, could be prats. Now, prats tends to be um, broken in pieces, okay? Doesn't sound as likely with them, but we will circle back around to that because remember this is this is just the the definitions as according to like you know strong's and jacinius and all of that they may be more or less likely to be really accurate okay um if it was parash with the shot in there um there's a lot of different definitions for that um some are again spread out spread low there's even an entry for Parash that's dung. Now, I might go for that, given what I know about the Pharisees, but it's just not as likely. And then there is Paras, or Pyrrhus. Now, Paris could be a few things. There's a number of entries on Paris, P-R-S. Um, one of those entries is you know, divide, like divide into, uh, we'll see it break into, we'll see it used as that. Um, divisions, there's uh, actually an animal that's called paras at, at one point in time, okay. Um, now, it's possible uh, because maybe what we're looking at is uh, sectarians you know um those who were in charge of religion which again we don't see people in charge of religion so much in the old testament in fact religion was something that would have been, was frowned upon sectarians well, maybe. You know, you, you might be able to, to make a case that perhaps this is transliterated from Paris, and that meant sectarians. And in fact, we'll lead this into the next thing. The, the other and more common appearance of this word Paris is in relation to the second kingdom prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. It was the kingdom that joined with another kingdom called Medi. Paris appears to be coming from far away. Now, most of you will know Paris from what it is usually altered into in virtually every translation we have, and that's Persia. But the word's actually Paris. Paris joined with Madi. Uh, Madi would, uh, it, it appears from what information we have that Madi actually came against Babel first. And in fact, the first king to take Babel was a king of Madi, not Paris. Paris came up sort of after they weren't part of the the first you know um wave of assaults on this kingdom this first great kingdom of babel which were the kashdim not the uh, chaldeans the kashdim um so what we have uh, according to the narrative that we find in the old testament we find these um the this uh, this great people called Paris, this great kingdom called Paris, which came up sort of after Madi, and they ended up being the more prominent and powerful of these two factions. Paris could actually be referring to a number of peoples that were sort of united as one. This kingdom, okay, and. When we leave off the um, the narrative in the Old Testament, we leave off with Paris still being in charge, um, still running things in the land of Canaan and surrounding lands. We knew that by the prophecy of Daniel that the kingdom would, that would come and defeat Paris would be called Yun. Yun has been 
uh, very bizarrely transliterated into Javan. And you have to use Jubru rules to get from Yun to Javan. Now, as I've told you before, Yun is actually, it's more, it's more properly just the base of, for instance, my name, John, or, well, I'm Yunatan. But John, that's what you would usually get from Yun is John, okay? And keep that in mind. Now, what we don't know is the year, the sort of time that Yun actually um, overtook this, this very large uh, outspread uh, empire of Paris. But what they would want us to believe was that Paris was Persia and that Yun was this this entity called Javan and that that entity was actually Greece. And they would like us to believe that these events occurred in Palestine and that Greece was this great kingdom that overwhelmed Paris. Now, besides the fact that there's no, actually, the, what proof we have, even in the establishment historians, you, when you read the descriptions, even from establishment historians, on the people of Greece or, or Persia, and if you understand who, in fact, the Israelites are today and would have been back then, it's, it's very silly to believe that those people overcame. But, more than that, we know that, for instance, Mahdi were descendant tribes from Noah, and we know that Ion were descendant tribes from Noah. But we also know that the, the Greeks, as per even the establishment historians, were this Mediterranean people that were heavily mixed with what we call Arabs, or Turks, and that the Persians, of course, are not white. They have a certain admixture of Caucasian in them, too. Now, these people weren't said to have these admixes. They were descendants of Noah. And you got to just use some common sense about what we see in the world today. Um, you know, un unless we're talking about something anecdotal, non-white kingdoms... Um, under their own, if, if under their own leadership even, let's just say under their own leadership, they never stand a chance against white armies. They just don't. The best chance they even have typically, and I said this has to be usually anecdotal, like a one-off kind of thing, is when their numbers can overwhelm us. So what's most logical is that we're looking at kingdoms that were made up of other Adamites, so other whites. We're, we're looking at that in this, this kingdom of the Kashdim. We're looking at this in the kingdom of Mahdi. We're looking at this in the kingdom of Paris. And we're looking at this in the kingdom of Yun. We don't even have a sort of mixing that we could, we could apply until we get to these feet of iron and clay. And that would be the mixing of the people of that little horn, which aren't exactly like the descendants of Noah, and the older monarchies that existed before that, that they uprooted. That's the fourth kingdom. That's the kingdom of Europe. All those monarchies, they were all related. We know that. And then we had the usurper who came up and uprooted three of those related monarchies and dynasties. That was kingdom number four, but we have kingdom number three. And all indications tell us that kingdom number three came from the east, uh, northern eastern Asia and southern Asia. I mean, it probably covered most of Asia, which is why uh, so much of, of Asia is referred to as in, inde, yun, See, it's all phonetically quite related. Every indication from everything that I can find in the Bible tells me that at the time that Yusho lived, 
that Judah, the kingdom of Judah, the, the land of Canaan and all surrounding lands were all occupied at that time by Yun. In fact, that may have been around the time that the little horn, because there's a little horn that is part of the kingdom of Yun, and there is a little horn that is part of the fourth kingdom. I think that is the same little horn. It would have been, I believe, right after the time of Christ that that little horn uh, started the, their war on the saints, as we see it uh, translated in Daniel. Why is this important? Well, because if it hadn't been long from the time that that this kingdom of Yun had, had taken away the power from this kingdom of Paris, then for one thing, there may have been a, a large number of people that may have been Judahites or Israelites that were culturally um, very much like the kingdom that had just retained power for maybe a few centuries or so, and that would have been Paris. And if it would have been that they were, were culturally, philosophically, so on and so forth, like them, they would still be genetically of Judah or Israel, but they would have been philosophically, culturally, or religiously like Paris, and would have been, I don't want to say realistically, um, always trying to think of the right words as I go here, uh, very understandably, they may have been referred to as the Pharisee, or Pharisee, or Pharisee. The thing that is additionally interesting about that, in just this passage, is that the way he says what he says, when he says the law and the prophets, now he doesn't just say this here, you have to understand that. I'm not trying to teach you from Luke as if this is the only source of this. He says this in other Gospels, including Matthew. We get this idea that the law and the prophets were until John. And let's see, we see the same idea repeated um, in Matthew, or maybe I should say taken from Matthew and repeated in Luke at various points in Matthew, one of them being Matthew 11, 9 through 14, and there's one other occurrence. And if you put the two together, you'd basically have this verse in Luke. But anyways, here in Luke 16, 16, it says the law and the prophets until John, since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. Okay, well, what's interesting about that is the fact that he just says John. Now, he doesn't say John the Baptist. He doesn't qualify that by saying John the Baptist, his disciple, or anything else. So, literally, if he's just saying in Obri the name Yun, do you see where I'm going with this? The Law and the Prophets, he could literally be saying the Law and the Prophets were in effect until Yun. What is he saying? Is he saying John the Baptist? Is he saying another John? Is he saying that kingdom, Yun? Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. And of course, that statement right there is a little bit, um, it's a bit obscure, of course, because we don't know exactly what's being said. And of course, tons of people speculate on this. And we're not taking into account all of the factors that we need to consider when looking at this. Besides the fact that this statement right here is likely just a piecing together of a couple of statements that we can find in Matthew. And then I won't go on to further expound on the next verse, which I already read, that's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one jot or tittle for the law to fail, which is very true, but it's just found in a bit different context in Luke than Matthew. The really bizarre thing I'm going to tell you about Lazarus and the rich man. I'm just going to point out a few things. I don't plan on spending a whole lot of time like exegeting anything about this. I spent a long time a few years ago. I went through this whole thing. I tracked all of the Greek words. I looked for all of their roots, um, trying to figure out all of the etymologies of these things because this was actually at the time when I was questioning whether even the idea of an eternal burning torment in hell was a viable doctrine or not. I mean, ever since then, of course, I've decided that it's, it's absolutely 
not. Absolutely not. And it's tough to see some of the, the, you know, there's a few guys out there preaching the word that I still like. It's really tough to, to know that a lot of these guys left out of the very few that I do like, because I, I said a lot of these guys. There's very few that I like or will listen to. But the majority of those very few, the majority of them, still believe in this or preach this hell doctrine, this eternal conscious burning sadistic torment doctrine, which is biblically untenable. I mean, if you haven't looked at a, if you haven't looked into it very far and, and you want some good resources on it, there are two that I would say, and there are, are plenty out there. You, you, you know, you start peeling this onion, there's a lot in the center, okay? But there's two out there that you can find a lot of material on probably right away. One of them is Sheldon Emery. There is the Sheldon Emery Memorial Library. And you can type that into most search engines and get linked to it, and you can go and find his audios. <clears throat> and he has a series concerning the, uh, the doctrine or dogma of the eternal uh, tormentous sadistic hell and the other one is Edward Fudge and and Edward Fudge comes from more a typical you know mainstream evangelical point of view where Sheldon Emery comes from an Israelite identity point of view so it's different points of view but they both explain to you why this this doctrine is this dogma is entirely untenable biblically but a lot of people who who stick to that doctrine because they want very i guess because they very much want a god who is not only um unbelievably loving but at the same time unbelievably sadistic and somehow you have to hold those two concepts in your mind at the same time and um and try to get them to harmonize or just ignore it because they don't harmonize. I'm not saying that he has to be two-dimensional, but there are there are, are certain things about someone's character that if you try to say they have this characteristic, and then you name another characteristic that absolutely goes against that first characteristic, they're not two-dimensional, three-dimensional, they're not playing four-dimensional chess, they just can't exist if certain characteristics are absolutely in contradistinction so much so if there's so much contrast there cannot be harmony just like with the sheer amount of contrasts there are between Luke and Matthew the contrast of the sadistic burning eternal hell is so contradictory to goodness kindness mercy and love that we see they are so against one another that, that you can't even say well they're they're two facets to a complex person no they're not they're so conflicting that he can't exist if he is both of those things and you know one of the chief one of the chief arguments that this Lazarus and the rich man is used for is this this hell, this idea. This idea of this eternal conscious, burning, suffering, horrific torment, forever idea of hell impugning the good character of Yahweh. Uh, terribly, terribly so. Even more than, you know, pointing out that... Um, if you believe the Palestinian Jew model, he's the desert god. So even more than that, I'd rather a, a decent and consistent desert god than a one like this. So it's used a lot by the people who want to argue for the, uh, the eternal conscious torment god um, idea. It's also used by others to try to argue this idea of um, it's used by people who believe that the Jews are Judah <laughs> and that 
so like British Israelism or Armstrongism, you know, and that the European peoples are Israel. It's used by Christian identity people. Um, for, it's used in so many different ways for people to try to argue their own pet theories. But it is, I'm going to just say it outright, this whole passage is bubkis. It's no good. It's no good. Now I'm going to show you why it's no good. Besides the fact that we see that he says he starts out, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now it is interesting. This is the only, if it's supposed to be a parable, if it's supposed to be a parable, this is the only parable in which he names somebody. And you know, the only other account that we have of someone named Lazarus that he may have known or that was actually raised from the dead or died or anything else is found in John. Yun. John. And I'm not so sure what I think of John right now either. So if, if we go by um, the signification of colors, you know, we could argue maybe that stood for Judah or something, you, you know, even though it was really the priesthood that was connected with certain colors and it was more than just purple or actually blue and white linen. Okay, so we don't have any specific connection. The best we could say is that he's just talking about colors that were specific to the rich, maybe because of certain dyes being very expensive. That's the best we can, you know, draw from this. A certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores. It's interesting. Well, if he, okay, let's think about this for a second. If he was laid at the gate and he was full of sores, who laid him at the, this guy's gate and why? If this guy did not give, if he did not give to beggars and people in need, no one would lay a beggar at his gate. It would be pointless to lay him at his gate, because I'm sure there were other rich men that would be better for him to be laid at the gate than this guy. If this guy was stingy, and I was a beggar full of sores. I would say, whatever you do, don't take me to that guy's gate, because I never get anything from him. If there was a rich man who gave, who would send out food, maybe medicine or other things, for the poor that he he is not required by the law even if he's rich he's not required to to give absolute and full like medical attention and food to certain people because he doesn't know why they are in the state they are in they could be in the state they are in because many phenomenon are just common to man and we're going to look at that because that's actually in ecclesiastes 9 there are things the uh, there, there are many things that are just common to man. And so we, we do need to be, if we're righteous, we do need to be compassionate. But he is not because he's been given much. He's not now somehow responsible for everyone who has infirmities. Okay? But if he's a decent and a good man, he would provide to a certain extent for people who were in need, whether it be by way of health or by way of, you know, their starvation or their clothing or whatever it is, okay? And no beggars, because I've been through enough cities, I've been to enough places, and I know, I know, I know beggars, and I know people who actually make a lifestyle begging, they don't go where there are slim pickings, whether they are a, a very sincere beggar and they are, are sickly and they are weak, or whether they're a scammer 
and they're, they're looking for handouts. They don't go to places that don't bear them fruit. So don't you think it's weird if this rich man was just a selfish guy that this Lazarus would be being brought to his gate? Don't you think that's just weird? Don't you think that doesn't really follow? Because I think it does. It says, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So they're saying he, he was brought there just, uh, the, uh, just the crumbs. And then the dogs licked his sores. And I've heard people, they go on with the symbolism of the dogs and everything else. And... um If all he got, being sick and weak and, and, and everything else, when he was brought to this rich man's gate, was the crumbs from his table and the dogs licking his sores. Well, first off, if you have people that are bringing him to his gate, that requires time and energy. And who's feeding them? For them to do this, what, daily? Bring him to the gate daily? Because it says he's brought to his gate. It didn't say he got there on his own. I mean, if you took whatever food and water it would take to to take care of the people that were bringing Lazarus to this guy's gate and just gave it to Lazarus, wouldn't that be more than the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table? And they bring him over there just so the dogs will lick his sores? Still doesn't really make sense to me. And we don't get to know why the rich man was rich, and we don't get to know why Lazarus was poor and diseased. Because, again, we're going to look, there are certain things common. Okay, that's really important. And we're not given a reason. So, if we're looking at something that's trying to give us a moral bead on something, we should have reasons. Because no one is ever condemned in the Law and the Prophets for being wealthy, ever. They're condemned for what they do with it. They're condemned with, for, for how they got it, if they got it lawlessly. Okay, But people who are lawful and decent and good are blessed with material things. This, is, this isn't just like a, um, a shyster health and wealth prosperity gospel thing. They, they twist all of that to their own advantage to get people to give them seed offerings that'll grow that kind of crap. Okay, They would be the rich men. And, and you would tell, if I told a story about them, these shyster televangelists that give <clears throat> people to give those seed offerings of faith and everything, and they, they enrich themselves by doing that. I would tell you, I would give you a reason what it was that they did to gain all of those riches. Okay, If I was telling you a parable that um, the main um, subject of the parable was Kenneth Copeland, I would tell you why he was so rich and what he did to get all of that which would have been entirely immoral. You would have gotten that it was lawlessness. He, he gained those riches through lawlessness. This is, a, this is simply a rich man. There's nothing immoral inherently about being rich. There's nothing immoral inherently about being poor and full of sores. Because Job spent quite a long time having nothing and being diseased. Get it? So if we're not given the moral reasons for any of this, then we have to just look at what we're about to look at, because we're going to be comparing, that there are so many things that are just, they are common occurrences, things that befall all men. So if we're not given reasons, we don't have anything to go on. We have to assume, like a lot of people assume, that just being rich is immoral. Or if somebody is poor and full of sores, they must be somehow righteous and, and needy and downtrodden and it's not their fault. And that's not true. There's plenty of people out there that are poor and malnourished and full of sores and it's their fault. We have to have more to go on. All right. So now it continues and says, 
And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abram's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Well, that's weird. So, what are we saying here, man? Are we saying that the, the beggar died and that his corpse was carried to Abraham's bosom? Because it, all, it follows that and it says the rich man died and was buried. Okay, so we assume that when he died, we're talking about his body was buried. It says Lazarus was carried to Abram's bosom. Well, Abraham wasn't still alive. I don't know of any geographical location that was called Abraham's bosom. Now, before I go any further, as I told you, we're going to look at one of the most serious and egregious problems with this, no matter what it is, no matter if it's being claimed as a parable, whether, and some people actually claim it as like, this is the Lazarus, this is the Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother. All right, there's a lot of different claims made about it. But before we look at any of those, we need to look at a really serious problem with it, no matter what you claim it is. And we'll find that in the bulk of it in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and just the first few verses. Now, starting in 9.1. Sorry, get a drink of coffee here. Starting in 9.1. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred, by all that is before them. Get what he's saying? I'll keep going. And I am reading the gray italics parts just for the flow of the sound of language. But you always need to, when you're reading, and you should be reading, peg those and know those are actually inserted to help, they say, to help the text flow. But just always pay attention. So, all things come alike to all. That's my problem with the first few verses of that account. He goes on to say, all alike to all. He's showing here there's this commonality in phenomenon or events, things that happen, occurrences, okay? One event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, to him that sacrifices and to him that sacrifices not, as is the good so is the sinner, and he that swears to he that fears an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Now before I, I read the next few verses, <clears throat> I just want to point out and make concise what he's saying here. He's saying we could condense this into other verses that we see throughout the scripture, like, for instance, the rain falls on both the just and the unjust. He's saying there are common things. They're part of living in the natural world. We live in a realm created that has natural rules. It has seasons. It has these very, uh, very common, very natural phenomena that happen to all people. Okay? That, and that right there is exactly why, besides everything I understand about the law and the fact that there's, there's nothing immoral about somebody being rich, there's nothing immoral about somebody being poor, per se, which there actually might be more wrong with somebody being immoral, but we don't know. The thing is, if somebody was poor or they were diseased, we see people getting diseased in the Old Testament because they were unrighteous. They were continually uh, in rebellion against Yahweh, so he struck them with disease. That does happen, but we need reasons. If we don't have reasons, we don't have anything else to go on because Solomon, who Jesus... Um, makes statements concerning the wisdom of Solomon. So we, we have, besides the fact that his literature that he wrote goes along with the prophets and the law, 
we have no reason to doubt that what he's saying to us is indeed true and consistent. He's saying that all kinds of things happen to all kinds of people. So we need to have more to go on when we look at certain things about people. When we look at somebody, they're wealthy. Can we make a judgment about them because they have a lot of money? Well, n not just because they have a lot. We have to look further in and see if it was gained. Uh, did they inherit it? If they did, were their parents crooks? Um, if they didn't, are they a crook? Um, if not, how in the world did they gain so much in this world that is run by the, the really the most despicable tribe to ever run the world in the history of the world? From everything I know, that's, that's a very fair and accurate statement. How did they get wealthy? Did they get wealthy because in spite of this tribe, they were blessed by Yahweh? Are they his servant? What are we not seeing? What, you know, we have to look for these things because there's always going to be reasons. And then, if there isn't per se a reason, there is this whole set of phenomenon that can potentially just happen to people because so many things are common. This is the point he's making. But then he goes on to say the next few things, these are really important, these next few things that he says, starting in 9.4, For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished neither have they any more a portion for ever in anything that is done under the sun when they're dead they're through now i'm going to tell you that i don't know what happens after death except cessation of consciousness that I, I absolutely believe I see in the Bible I've, there's lots of verses that I've gone over and over and over and over and over in the Bible that speaks of the same thing a cessation of action and consciousness like when we go to sleep at night there is a cessation of action and consciousness unless you toss and turn a lot but there is that cessation of consciousness I don't know, I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't know what happens besides that, but there would have to be a resurrection. Everything in the Bible contributes to an understanding that if we are not acting as ourselves, which is a marriage of this sort of flesh with our, our mind, or, or whatever you want to call it, our spirit, that those two things, they act together to give us personality, life, being, okay? This idea of the separation between the two is not, it's not biblical. As a creation, man is a physical being, so when he dies, he's dead. Now, I'm, I'm not saying there's no resurrection, because the funny thing about that is, there are a lot of indications throughout the Old Testament. And I'm not going to talk about the ideas that we get from the New Testament because they're like the idea of a eternal burning conscious torment in hell. They are ideas that have been fooled with a lot that we would probably be wise to not anchor doctrine on per se. But the one thing that seems to have the most amount of merit is an actual resurrection, you know, of an actual body where our consciousness would once again be um, active, alive, and vital. Does this happen to everyone? I don't know. I'm serious. Does it happen to just some? I don't know. There are some who never died 
but I would think that that, that that's the that's the severe minority. Okay. But what we do know is when you die, you have no more consciousness. You cease at death. Uh, okay, I'll bring up Sheldon Emery again because he's got uh, so many good sermons. I don't agree with everything he, th he thought or taught, but he has so many good sermons. And so did his understudy. Um, his name was Ben. I don't remember his last name. Williams. Ben Williams. Um, he had the, uh, another really good sermon about how the, um, the patriarchs and others in the Bible feared death because they knew that that was the cessation of their life. You see? So we can't find these teachings other than fancies and, and these real weird, obscure verses, like, for instance, when Saul goes to the witch of Endor, right? Because he wants her to communicate with Samuel. And they say, well, see there, I mean, like, there, there's Samuel in his spirit body. So there's, you know, good hard proof, but they don't pay attention to the fact that, first off, this witch who is a shyster, and we know that most so-called witches and mediums and people that are, are in those fields, we know they're con men, most of them, the ghost hunters, con men. We know they're con men. And we know she was a con man, or woman, too, because when she actually did see the spirit of Samuel coming up from the earth, it scared the daylights out of her. Why? Why would it scare the daylights out of her? If, that, if that's the thing that she saw commonly, why would that bother her at all? Oh, hey, here's Samuel. Lay your money down. I did it. That's what I do, you know. I communicate with the dead spirits all the time. That's what I do. No, she was a she was con man. And when Samuel actually did come up, it frightened the daylights out of her. Because she wasn't expecting that, because they're con men. They convince people that they talk to spirits or see spirits or whatever, and they don't because they're con men. That's why you're not supposed to go to any of those people right in the law, because those are liars that will convince you of things that aren't true. It's not because they're speaking to Beelzebub and he's going to tell you about some, uh, amazing uh, evil plan that he's hatched it's because they're liars and they convince you of lies and they convince you of things that aren't true and they put the stamp of approval on it by the spirits gave it to me or some of them even tell you god spoke to me they're liars we have the word go on the word that's what we need to do go by the word if we claim to believe the word, if we don't claim to believe the word, what are you doing here? We have the word to go by. And the word tells us in death there is a secession of consciousness, activity, and thought. That's what death is. It's no life. And we have no indication throughout the scriptures that there is any activity after death. But in this account of Lazarus and the rich man, there's all kinds of activity, right? Because it says here, after it says that the beggar died and he was taken to Abraham's bosom, whatever that is, because Abraham should be dead and in the ground. So I don't know what bosom and then it says uh, in verse 23, and in hell, it's Ades or Hades. And this is, this is why the people who don't believe in the eternal conscious torment, they'll argue, well, that's just the afterlife. That's just the Koine Greek equivalent of Sheol. They'll tell you. Okay, that's not my argument. Anyways, so it says, you know, he lift up his eyes being in torments. And you see, once the people who are against the burning uh, eternal hell torment thing, once the ones that are against it, they start looking at this and trying to argue it out. They're positioned. Uh, this can't make sense to them either. 
because it's like why is it why is this going on why is why is the rich man asking for what he's asking None, it doesn't make sense in either context, folks. So, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Apparently, they were hugging the whole time from the time Lazarus died until the rich man died. Did they die? Did they get in a car accident together? But from the, from the time of the one to the other, I guess Abraham and Lazarus were hugging. The whole time, because Abraham doesn't have other people to hug. No, the bosom is his place. It's 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 a place, right? Well, if you look up bosom in Obery, you'll see that it's actually no. It's we're talking about your uh, like caressing. You're close. You even look at this this word that's translated as bosom here. This kolpos. It means basically about the same thing. So anyways, to continue the story, it says the rich man, he lift up his eyes being in torment and somehow he can see through time and space. And he sees nothing else but Lazarus. This, this idiot Lazarus, apparently, right? Because he's going to be painted as, as a really awful person, this rich man. He would see this idiot Lazarus who kept coming to his gate even though he didn't give him anything. The dummy. He sees him in Abraham's bosom. And it says, and he cried and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. I don't know why he'd want him to send Lazarus. He didn't give him anything, right? Why well, wouldn't Lazarus care? And why trouble Lazarus? Doesn't Abraham have a lot of people in his bosom? Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Very emotional. Get a very emotional response. I remember tracts. They would give out these tracts, and they would quote that, right? And they would show the rich man burning, burning in his flame. Guys, have you ever been burned, like get a, a bad burn? It's just unfreaking believable. Anyways, and they would have him there in his in tormented flames and sweat pouring down, which doesn't really make sense that, that the sweat would even be able to beat up and pour. But anyways, look, I suppose if I was in a burning, tormented flame, a drop of water wouldn't mean jack. I don't care. I don't care what. A drop of water would mean jack. Diddly squat. Forget it. Too little, too late. But if, if I were, if it was just so insanely, uh, you know, which it would be, a drop of water, <clears throat> and I sure wouldn't want it on my tongue, you know, I, I, if it's only a drop, look, it's not going to do any good. I don't care where you put it. It's not going to do any good. But I think I would rather have it on one of those spots on the outside of me that was being burned. Because apparently, if you if you go to this eternal conscious torment, you got your body back with all the sensations and everything, even though the scriptures tell us that we don't have that anymore once we're dead. Our body's rotting in the ground, but we're given a new body. We're given a magical spiritual body that can feel physical fire and flame. None of it makes any sense. And in verse 25, but Abraham said, son? Oh, he's, he's genetically related to him. Is that what we're supposed to get from this? Or is he just being a wise old man? Son, remember that in thy lifetime, he's going to talk sense to a guy who's being burned in a flame freaking unbelievable. Remember thou lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Do you get what I'm saying by the fact that even the people that don't believe in the eternal conscious torment, they can't make any sense of this, because if he's not in some kind of flaming eternal torment, what does he need the water for? What does he need the water for? What does he need a drop of water for, man? Please send him over with a drop of water. Why? 
And now he's making a judgment. He's saying Abraham's making a judgment. Do you remember you had all these good things and he didn't have good things? And so, so now we're making a moral judgment on you, even though we don't know anything about you other than you were rich. And the Bible never condemns anyone for being rich. It never condemns anyone for being poor and having diseases and stuff. And in fact, in fact, if we want to go that route, we could make a better argument for someone that was full of disease and poorness and sores being lawless than the rich man, based on the Bible. And then he goes on to say, but besides, there's this great gulf between us, and no one can pass from you to us or from us to you. So now he's not alone. Now there's, I guess, a lot of people with him. They must be all the rich people. Right? I wonder where the cutoff is as far as how unrighteous you are by what you actually have you know, what the cutoff is, you know, if you make, if you make, I don't know what, like 50 grand or more a year, is that, are you in danger is what I'm saying. I just want to know 80 grand a year. Are you in serious danger of ending up in this place? I just, I'd like to know. I mean, because if, if that was a problem or something, I might, charge less or cut back on my hours or something, I would certainly want to stay under that danger line of, of, of income uh, or, or affluency, you know, because this is concerning me now. I don't know what kind of gulf this is. It's a magical spiritual gulf, I guess, between the bad people who made too much and, uh, and the good people that are diseased with their sores and stuff because we all know that people who are diseased and malnourished and full of sores they're not they're not heroin addicts and whores and stuff they're just misfortunate they're not just not as fortunate as you okay and you need you need to use your white privilege to take care of those people because you're you are only doing good because of your privilege and your racism what are we getting out of this what are we getting out of this so-called parable i'm not and i've read this seriously don't act like don't act like for some reason i'm just trying to prove my point because i've got better things to do i've approached this account many times very seriously And no, it doesn't make sense. I don't say the things I say because I want to be right. I want people to look at him and say, you remember him? He was the rightest person. He was right about everything he says. I don't care about being right. I care about what is right. That's the difference. Okay, and then it just continues, and he says, I pray thee, therefore, Father, you would send him to my father's house. Well, who's your father? It's the same word. For I have five, oh no, she's now a number. Now, a num now they can play with it, the people that get into the numbers, man. They can play with this. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So the people that argue that either that this guy is from the Jews or Judah, you know, they'll say that Judah had five brothers. Well, actually, Judah did. So Judah was the son of Leah. Leah was the one of the two sisters that was not as loved as Rachel. She's probably a little uglier. Um, but she, Yahweh blessed her because she was not well loved by Jacob. And she probably wasn't well loved by her father. And just she wasn't treated great because she wasn't great looking. He blessed her immensely. And, and she had f at least she had six sons and at least one daughter. Okay. The six she had were Reuben, then Simeon, then Levi, then Judah, and Zebulun and Issachar. And then she had Dina. So they they would take this five and they would argue and they would say, He's Judah. 
I don't know. I'll tell you something else that we see here that's kind of weird, given the how many sixes and multiples of sixes and twelves and eighteens we saw just a couple chapters ago. If he has five brothers, that makes six of them. Here comes that six again in Luke. So that's a little weird, right? But there's not a lot of conclusive stuff you can put together. It's like it's like when we looked at um it's like when we looked at the prodigal son, whether it was a parable or a story. Because the, the, the way that so many of these accounts are told in Luke, we don't know if it's a parable or a story. What the What is this? It's the same thing with the prodigal son. The problem is there's too many inconsistencies and oddities to these accounts to definitely pin it and say this is this or this is this. We have to say it's all anecdotal. And then if we're going to take these anecdotal things, mostly found only in Luke, like the prodigal son, like uh, Lazarus and the rich man, like the account of the unrighteous steward, and we're going to build doctrine on it, man, man, talk about, and we're going to lead people based on that, talk about both people falling into a ditch, and it's going to be a big, deep one. And then there's the there's the next few verses, which are I think are a lot more agreeable. When he <laughs> says Abraham says to him, they have Moses and the prophets. <laughs> yeah, I agree. They have Moses and the prophets. This is this is the part that's actually it's very strong. They have Moses and the prophets. Yes, they do. They should listen to them. And he said, now that's interesting too. Because that, that would tell you that Moses and the prophets probably appeared together as a, as a complete volume, much very early. Okay, just And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. And he said to him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And I do think it's weird that in the Gospel of John, and only in the Gospel of John, do we have the account of this Lazarus, brother of Mary and Martha, who is said to have been raised from the dead, right? It's interesting. Because the only two Gospels we're going to find this Lazarus character in, whether it be in the context of this Lazarus and the rich man, or the Mary and Martha thing, which is John, you know, is Luke and John. Um, and that's the way it ends. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way this parable or story or account or whatever ends. No resolution. So that whole thing, I guess, was told to, for some reason, for, to get to the Law and the Prophets. The Law and the Prophets? Okay. All right. Well, if if that were the point of it to get us there about people wouldn't believe even if they, somebody raised from the dead, that they, they have Moses and the Prophets, they need to believe Moses and the Prophets. All right. Well, if if that's the point of what we just saw here with Lazarus and the rich man, fine. Fine. But here's the problem. The law and the prophets don't condemn anyone for being rich. He didn't say that his brothers were lawless. What, they're rich too? Okay. The law doesn't condemn anyone for being rich. What's the point? What's, what's the point, man? What's the point besides either... Convincing people of some kind of a flaky afterlife weirdness thing that we don't even see this in other accounts of people, you know, like that, that they could point to and say, this is what hell's like, or this is what heaven's like. It's not even like any of that. It's so weird and bizarre. Was that the point to, to just convince us of this weird, bizarre, you know, sort of pagan belief of the, this heaven and hell? Cause that's mostly it's pagan. These, these ideas that we have uh, married into Bible believingness or Christianity. You're mostly pagan. Is that what it is? Is that that's supposed to be the mo main point and thrust? Because that's what most people use it for, actually. Is it 
what? Is it condemning Judah? Is it condemning Israel? Because it's not doing a very good job if that's what it's doing. And Judah, at this point in time, they were entirely oppressed by foreigners. How is it that they would be the rich man if this was all um, symbolic? Hmm? I don't get it. Is it about the Pharisees? I mean, is it about the Pharisees? And then the, the beggar is what? The people? It never, it never says the Pharisees were necessarily bad to the people It, in the sense of like physical real things, which is supposed to be what's inferred here between Lazarus and the rich man. They taught the people traditions which are wrong. They needed to be teaching and keeping the law. That's true. That would be the most harmful thing they did, but we don't have any indication uh, that that's the illusion being made here. What I see here is just some kind of like touchy, feely, emotional, social justice thing with a complete weirdness to it all. In this whole idea of Abraham's bosom, heaven, the great gulf, the, the flame, the water on the tongue, it makes for great tracts. Maybe Chick's got a few. I bet you they do. I bet you Chick tracts got plenty that depict this freak show. But no other gospel, and nowhere else in the Bible, I posit, will support any of this. And with that, I'm just going to have to let you go and see you next time. Thanks.